Knocks it through. Mullen bursting into the box. Josh Mullen. Mullen's ball across. It's turned in. It's Pittman who's got it. Livingston leads. Now can they get the ball back in? O'Brien. The lead. And Livingston have the lead. Man, the score. The full time whistle blows and David Hay celebrates. And the Livingston fans join in exultation. Livingston had the lead against Rangers. And they are certainly rising to a few occasions on their return to the top flight in Scotland. Hello and welcome back to Talk Livy, the podcast dedicated to everything Livingston Football Club and Scottish football. My name's June, and today it's just Angus and I. Angus, how are you doing? For, for our listeners' benefit, he's had an accident in the garden with the garden shears because he has got some haircut on the go there. Honestly, it's absolute disrespect. You'll go to my Instagram later on and you'll see just how fresh it is. But yeah, not doing too bad. Um, yeah, just trying to keep myself occupied. Um, been put into isolation, got pinged uh, yesterday. Um, was kind of doing basically the isolation prior to that anyway, but kind of made official now. But yeah, just uh, try to keep myself occupied. And yeah, the result of the hair is one of the casualties of that, to be fair. Uh, <laughs> so it's only 10 days, mate. It's not like the four months of lockdown. Jesus, you must be you must be spinning a bit your room, man, going mad if you're doing that. I feel like the first one just took too much out of me now and I'm just like, a, I'm a shell of the man I once was and it's, it's cracked me already. <laughs> right, well, as always, you can find this episode as well as all our other episodes on your preferred podcast streaming site. Just search for Total Levy to follow us or subscribe to ensure that you don't miss another episode. Uh, we'll start the episode off by talking about our trip to Easter Road as we took on Hibs in the Scottish Premiership. We also look at how the Livingston women's team got on as they faced Gart Cairn for the second time in two weeks. International duty returns this weekend, so we'll take a quick look at Scotland before a preview of Livy's next league game against Dundee. A depleted Livy squad travelled to Leith in search of their first points of the season, but it wasn't to be. His goals from Kevin Nisbet and Martin Boyle gave Hibs a 2-0 victory. It's now four games and zero points at the start of our league campaign. There was obviously a bit of meltdown amongst some supporters, uh, as always happens in football. But uh, is it as bad as some folk are making out, Angus? Nah, it definitely isn't nearly as bad as some people are making out. I mean, there's a core of our support who I do believe, like, regardless of anything, I mean, like, we could go on, like, such like, a good run, like we did last season, lose one game and then suddenly it is, like, completely end of the world. I think there's a lot of circumstances that really need to be taken into consideration, especially for that game yesterday. But, you know, we say that four games there, two away against Rangers and Hibs now, one at home to Aberdeen. They're straight away, those are three games that realistically a team like Livingston probably shouldn't be picking up any points from. You can maybe argue the Aberdeen one, in which you would also look at that game individually and say, should have got something from it. It's a one error that's kind of really cost us in the end. But yeah, going to Hibs yesterday, depleted squad. I mean, we've got players throwing up at half time. We've got players having to be subbed off because they're being sick. A player suffering a diabetic fit during the game as well. Um, an injury before the match. No, actually, I am... Um, uh, a warning of like a COVID test before the game even started as well. So you just look at that kind of preparation. I think you've got to take it with a pinch of salt. And I don't think we were, we weren't shocking. We weren't good, but I don't think Hibs were necessarily that great either. I think it was just overall a really kind of crap game of football. Second half, I think Hibs stepped up for sure. And I will say that Hibs did deserve the win. They did show that extra quality with the likes of this bit and Boyle. And um, both took their goals really, really well. And um, But I can see some of like the supporters kind of like murmurs and that have been like disappointed, but I don't think that that performance quite merits it. I think we've seen a lot worse. Um, we've definitely seen a lot worse over the past year. But you know what that happens when you're in that kind of slump. I think that uh, things are kind of escalated to a point where you know 
not to be like happy with the kind of performance or whatnot, but I think we've just got to be realistic. Like it, it really wasn't that bad in all honesty. But we've got to dust ourselves off. I think um, the international break is coming at a perfect time for us, you know, to get you know not only like kind of back into things, like work on a couple of. Uh, kind of issues at the club but just for the players health in general in all honesty we've got a couple of players with a sickness bug in that hopefully you know a week 10 days 14 like two weeks off or that can do us like the world of good and uh, come that game against Dundee we will be firing but yeah you and I am I'm assuming you were at the game unfortunately I wasn't able to be there your thoughts any different to mine's yeah I kind of echo your initial thoughts I'm guessing that at the end of the day the result doesn't really mean a great deal when you know, the players' welfare is kind of in question there. As you say, there's players playing with sickness bug, throwing up at half time. Obviously, Bruce Anderson was taken to hospital, and we we wish Bruce and I think it was Max and Jack Fitzwater as well uh, quick recoveries from from their sickness bugs. And Bruce's was a diabetic issue, but I don't think we played that badly. You know, the the what's being made out. I think we were competitive in the game. A couple of couple of points first half you know I think Bruce Anderson had a decent chance well worked set piece he's put it well wide though it's not really threatened in the end there was one that didn't seem to get a lot of attention you might add a better angle of it on the on the cameras obviously we're the opposite end of the park but it looked like we had a decent claim for a penalty to be honest uh, it was Sybil kind of midway through the first half on round about the edge of the box I don't know if you had a better angle of that than I did I don't think it would have been a penalty I think it was outside of the box um, but I think the main thing is we should have had something because I'm sure it's either Alan Forrest or Bruce Anderson passes the ball to Sibbald, who then gets clattered. The ball falls to Sibbald. And then even if the referee deems that, you know, the Hibs player's taking the ball off of Sibbald cleanly, there's no advantage. So we should get essentially something. But I think both of them might have been just outside of the box. Yeah. I, I wasn't quite sure because obviously we are 80, 100 yards <laughs> up the end of the park. <laughs> but... I think I think we were very competitive. I thought Jason Holt was very productive in the middle of the park yesterday. I think he he was really good at kind of stopping the play where he had to, breaking up the game, uh, made a few really important challenges. But as I say, a couple of points that were frustrating me first half was, especially down our left-hand side, we seemed to just allow Boyle and McGinn to just go and put crosses into our box. There didn't seem a real urgency to stop the ball coming into our box. Boyle's a player that's been banging for him for the last 18 months or so. Uh, you know, that's why Hibs have been desperate to tie him down on a longer term deal. And, you know, if you keep allowing bo- balls to come into your box like that, it's a matter of time before a chance is created. And then they got a chance kind of tail end of the half. It was Nisbet header kind of harmlessly wide. But as I say, there was very little between the two teams. I think we did well to, to kind of disrupt Hibs and not get them into a real flow. They had a lot of the ball, but without really doing a great deal. And then another... Becoming deja vu. We're talking about the early <laughs> second half goal. Jack Fitzwater's had to come off. Uh, Sean Kelly's come on. And I believe Sean Kelly had a rib issue as well. I don't know if that was prior to coming on or, or during the game it happened, but he's been he's, he's been turned too easily for me by Nisbet. You know, it's a it's a hopeful ball by McGinn down the touchline. A uh, line ball and Nisbet's don't, don't get me wrong, it's good quality by Nisbet. He's turned his man and he's he's rolled it into the far corner really well. But I think it's just, it's too easy. It's far too easy. And um, we plugged away, we kept ourselves in the game. Uh, Keegan Jacobs came on and again. I think he added a bit of steel to the middle of the park for us. Again, broke up the game really well in spells. Jack Hamilton had a header, you know, which threatened. But again, I think Bailey had a free kick that went just wide. But again, it's kind of very little in terms of clear-cut opportunities. But again, you can see the same down the opposite end. Hibs weren't peppering Max. I think Max made one save other than pick the ball out his neck twice. But another another deja vu moment, another late goal, 90 minutes odd. It's so passive. Nobody puts pressure on the ball for a good minute, minute and a half of play in that far corner. Nobody puts any pressure on the ball, and that is so unlike us. This is where I would, again, I don't want to fall into that category of hitting the alarm bells. We're four league games into the season and we've had an incredibly tough start both on and off the field with issues that we've had. But there's just little things that are creeping into our game which we haven't had over the last few years. It gives you a few alarm bells. But I agree with you, Angus. I think the international break's coming at an ideal time. It allows to regroup, hopefully get players back in training, back fit, healthy, just in general, just healthy. 
and hopefully we can go again for the for the Dundee game. But yeah, I think some of the reaction has been over the top, and I think you need. I said it at the start of the season we, when we done our preview for the season. I guess that there's a number of new players that have come in the door, a number of players have left. It's going to take time. You you need to understand that this very rarely does that many players just click like that. And it is going to take time, but I think middle to front, we're okay. And I think it will come good at some point. We still need work at the back. That's the thing that I will say that I will, I will agree with the kind of, the more negative like kind of critiques of our side this season. And I think that our preparation at the back this year as a whole has been very, very poor. Whether that's recruitment, whether that's what we're doing on the training ground, it's not good enough. And it is the reason why we're losing some of these games. And that's what you're talking about. Midfield and attack, we do seem to be you know competing well enough. We're staying in the game with most of these teams. I mean, you look at the Aberdeen game, I mean, we're how close we are to winning that. And the Morwell game, very competitive. And even that, like, even though we weren't great against Hibs, we we're still, you know, decent away from home. We just can't keep on conceding the same goal after half time, and then you know the same goal kind of later on as well, where we're just so passive. And I think that is a part where the club kind of have to you know hold their hands up and be like, you know what, maybe we've kind of misguided this so far. I don't think that we should have been going into this season with you know as few kind of centre back options. I mean, I've, we've talked about this an awful lot. I'm just desperate for you know somebody to come in. I don't. I don't buy Davy saying that he's comfortable with who we've got. I think that's maybe a wee bit shielding. Park seems to be absolutely nowhere. Kelly, I've spoken to a lot of Ross County fans and you know they've said that he's not a centre half. I always brought in to be aimed as like a defensive midfielder, leaving just Fitzwater. Fitzwater obviously went off it uh, ill there as well. So it just shows you like how kind of like bare fred we are. And I think it's really concerning in all honesty. But again, we've got to give it time. Let's see what happens. But I really hope that we do see somebody coming in, but just wasn't to be our day. You talked about Martin Boyle earlier on. I think um, I think it was a very, very tough game for James Penrice to be chucked back into. Obviously, he'd been, you know, um, isolating for quite a wee while. Boyle, I think, gave him a wee bit of a lesson in all honesty. I thought Boyle was giving him a very, very torrid time. And But to be fair, Penrice never once gave up, always kept on going. And But I think that kind of plays into the last goal. I think you can see how tired, you know, he was from chasing Boyle and, you know, Boyle's absolutely just dinked it over the goalkeeper tre- uh, tremendously. And sometimes that team just has better quality and you've kind of got to hold your hands up to it. But yeah, it's a tough one to take, but I don't think we should necessarily be, you know, too worried about it. You know, Sybil had to play when Davies said that he probably shouldn't have either. So there's another one to add to it. So you're talking about Shriek, Fitzwater, Anderson, all ill. Sybil's having to, you know, kind of like come on uh, after having to play more than he probably should have. Penrice coming out of just being in isolation. Keegan Jacobs playing like his second or third game back since he's, you know, been out for over 18 months. We are in a, a situation where, you know, we are operating with nowhere near our kind of full squad. And it's not great right now, but the important thing is for us to, you know, keep on backing the team, not lose any faith and uh, just keep on supporting them and hopefully things will come right. Um, but, you know, I think we've got a long way to go. The season's got plenty of games to play. We will pick up points. Um, we will start playing a lot better, but yeah, we've just got to keep supporting the team until then. Yeah, I think yeah. you're right, Angus. You know, I think Davey listed it was 11 players in total that were unavailable, which, you know, for, I think we've got a squad size of maybe 24 and Davey was saying three or four of the players on the bench were literally just filling a jersey for the day, um, which I think says the, the state of things uh, in terms of the squad being at its at its limits. Where I would look at that, you've got Max playing whilst he's sick, Jack playing whilst he's sick, Sibs coming and playing. Anyone who says that the players aren't behind the manager and aren't playing for the manager, I think that says that they are because these players could easily turn around and go, Nah, I'm not I'm no at it today. But they've went out there, Jack Fitzwater at half time spewing up and he goes, Look, I'll give the second half a go. You know, I think I think that speaks volumes of the player's attitude. Yeah. Right, playing up against an international player. <laughs> exactly. I think it speaks volumes of the player's attitude to to do that. Sybil in particular as well. You know, Sybil's had a torrid time since the start of the season. You know, with COVID obviously being asthmatic as well, with suffering from COVID can't be easy. He's had a couple of knocks and he's coming and played. You know, I saw Nicky Devlin was chatting during the week. He's had COVID issue. He had a punctured lung, you know, and he's barely had a pre-season and he's playing another 90 minutes. 
So for anyone that says that players aren't behind the manager, I, I think that that says a lot, the, the attitude of the players, because they could quite easily turn around and go, you know what, Gaffer, I'm not for it today. Yeah, I'm not feeling quite up to it. And I think that shows uh, shows the attitude. But yeah, you've got to stick with the team. I think you know we've got three very difficult fixtures out the way in our first four. I know we've got Celtic in a couple of weeks, but it is starting to make that Dundee game look pretty big, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Um, maybe it's a bit early in the season to say must win, but it may be. But of course, we'll get onto that later on. But yeah, you're absolutely spot on. I mean, you look at the kind of players that are missing. I mean, even Scott Pittman was missing. Scott Pittman never misses a game. Um, and that just shows you how, you know, kind of like depleted their squad was. But what can we say? Um, aye. There's not really much more to say about it. You know, 2 0 away at Hibs, not the worst of the results, not the worst of performances. Yeah, we could do better, but with the circumstances that are kind of going on, I think it paints a new light. And that's not just making excuses for the team, it's just being realistic in all honesty. But got to just put it behind us and hopefully over this wee break that we can, you know, get back to get back to normal and hopefully our team will be healthy more so than anything and uh, raring to go when it comes to that Dundee game. The Lionesses were back in action as they looked to get revenge on Gart Cairn following a late defeat last weekend. Our lassies would come out on top of a 1-0 victory, seeing us progress through to the next round of the Cup. Ewan, you took this one in. What did you make of the contest? Yeah, I can, I can see why Paul Jack and Ellie was saying Gart Cairn could, are going to challenge this year because I thought they were they would look very professional and they were very competitive in the game. I think kind of opening 10, 15 minutes, wee bit scrappy like... The games that we've seen already this season, we bit scrappy, but you know both teams had chances first half. Um, Terry Deegan on another day could have had two or three first half alone. A couple of shots wide, header saved, header wide as well. Um, but Cart Cairn had their chances as well. But again, not really, not really testing the keeper at all. And I think Jess Murphy had the chance of the first half, had acres of space, uh, dead ball by by Rachel Walkinshaw, and swung it in, and uh, Jess is headed it wide, but. Uh, so probably chances wise, maybe should have been ahead at the break because I think we created the better opportunities. But uh, second half, I think, was a different story. I think we dominated for for large spells of the second half. Again, Terry Deegan had another one. Keeper saved it. Vicky Wood hit the post as well when she went through 1v1, come off the inside of the post and just didn't land to anyone when it bounced back into the area. So it was kind of looking like this one could go the distance. But late on... Great corner whipped in at the front post and Jess Murphy, bullet header into the top corner. Uh, just got in front of the keeper for it. Uh, brilliant header. Deservedly went 1-0 in front as a result of that. But I think, you know, we spoke about player welfare and there was a good example of it in the game today. Gart Cairn goalkeeper was down injured in the six-yard box. Very, seemed like a very innocuous incident. There was just a loose ball and uh, she remained kind of down and, it ended up with the game being paused for a significant period of time and an ambulance crew coming to, to stretch her off the park. Hopefully, if any if anyone from Gart Cairn is listening, we wish her the best and hope she's okay and uh, it's nothing too serious. But it just kind of puts football in perspective a little bit at times. Um, and to be fair, the game only had, I think, five, six, seven minutes to go and managed to get the game finished. And uh, fair play to the girls on both sides for, for getting the game going again. Didn't have to obviously get abandoned and you know focusing on the game as well to see the game out. But I think uh, it was a thoroughly deserved deserved result and into the next round of the cup and a bit of revenge for for last week's defeat to Cart Cairn certainly. Yeah, obviously playing them last weekend, um, it would have been very disappointing kind of losing that late goal to lose three two because they definitely deserve something from that game. Um, it was mainly kind of three instances where they kind of switched off, especially um, either side of half time. Um, obviously I had the chance to speak to Paul after that game and he was talking about how you know he just felt it was like more application that they needed a wee bit more quality on the ball rather than you know kind of switching up kind of like formations or that. I mean did they line up again with the 5-3-2 and um, that's what they went with the first time that they played them but was it a lot more were they a lot more crisp on the ball this time would you say obviously you didn't see the first game but did there seemed to be an improvement in the kind of the tempo and like the emphasis on attacking yeah, I think, as I say, second half in particular controlled the game a lot. I think Shannon Mulligan was very good at, 
you know, recovering the ball, breaking the game up at times when Gart Cairn did get possession. But as I say, totally controlled the game. Fiona Boslin was really good at coming out on the ball, uh, as was Jess Murphy from the back. Ali Strike came on, left-hand side, second half, and I think she added quite a lot uh, in terms of going forward, the attacking threat on the left-hand side as well, uh, when she came on, certainly. So, yeah, I think, you know, obviously I, I missed last week, I'm going on your perspective of it, but I think, as I say, they showed a lot more control of the game, probably last 15 minutes of the of the first half, certainly, and then second half, again, they they upped it and totally controlled the game. And it could have been more in the end, uh, to be totally honest with you, Angus. Uh, one now probably slightly flatters Gart Cairn based on the second half performance. Um, but as I say, it's you know it's a cup game. Main, main aspect of a cup game is to get through to the next round and in the draw. So that's what the girls have managed to do. Two goals in two weeks from Jess Murphy. Uh, a clean sheet as well now as well. Drawing quite some, uh, some similarities to a, a lovely favourite, John Guffrey. Uh, another, another strong performance from Jess. Yeah, Jess was brilliant. Again, just her usual self, crunching into tackles, winning everything at the back. And uh, she could have, she probably should have had another goal, to be honest. Uh, as I say, first half, missed a very good chance, but she's made up for it. Uh, took her goal really well. As I say, brilliant bullet header at the front post. And you know it was a, a deserved uh, reward for her performance. Ideal. Uh, yeah, and progressing through the next round of the Cup, um, I guess we'll need to see who they get. But yeah, we'll be sure to cover that and the next kind of league game when, whenever we can. So yeah, keep an eye on uh, our content to, to hear more about the Livingston Women's team. It's a busy week for the national team as we have three games this week starting off with a tough away game to Denmark. Following that, we host Moldova before travelling to Austria. I guess uh, you've had a wee look at the squad. Uh, what's your thoughts on the squad? There's obviously a couple of major omissions. Uh, Scott McTominay being probably the, the most eye-catching of the ones that are missing out. But obviously, he's gone for groin surgery. We hope he recovers very quickly. But what's your thoughts on the squad overall? Um, I'm, I don't really have too many qualms about it, in all honesty. Um, the only thing I would maybe be concerned about is that, you know, still none of the Ace and Johnson defenders managed to, you know, creep up into the squad, especially a couple of the uh, the players who have missed out. You know, you just mentioned McTominay there, mainly plays a centre-back for us. You'd imagine that somebody would have came in. Obviously, Andrew Considine had like a leg break, so that kind of ruled him out. So you're maybe thinking, you know, like so Jason Kerr could have maybe crept in there, but... I guess uh, Steve Clark's kind of got like his kind of backline selection. He's kind of happy with that, and you know, just getting kind of get on with it. Happy with the two keepers brought up, Xander Clark and Liam Kelly. And um, good to see you know a couple of younger faces in the squad. Um, obviously, Marshall did absolutely tremendous for us in those last couple of campaigns. But you know, third choice goalkeeper getting to the you no know, like near the age of forty. We don't really need three goalkeepers who are all, you know, above 34. Two of them aren't playing week in, week out either. So I think it is a kind of right time, you know, to bring in and see, you know, what else is out there. Um, obviously, I don't think Kelly or Clark are really going to get any game time. I think Gordon deservedly will be the number one. Um, but aye, it'll be an interesting kind of tie uh, affair because, you know, we've kind of talked about the squad being announced there and then, like, further news has came out with a whole abundance of players who, you know, may be missing. Uh, John McGinn's supposed to be isolating, so he'll definitely miss, you know, that first game. And Postacoglu said that it's very unlikely that Greg Taylor and James Forrest will be available for the squad. Nathan Patterson also isolating, so he may not show up. Uh, Stuart Armstrong's already pulled out, so... You also mentioned Stephen O'Donnell before we started recording this as well. He's not played an awful lot. So, in all honesty, the squad could be a wee bit different. And, you know, kind of got to keep an eye on that and see, you know, who else kind of get calls up, uh, gets called up to, to help us out. But at the end of the day, you and we've called up London Dykes, so we're going to we're gonna smash it, aren't we? Yeah, just to, just to touch on the, the two goalkeepers, yeah, you're spot on. I think um, there was a few fans that kind of mentioned that the Euros, like, Oh, he's only selected David Marshall because of you know loyalty and you know sentiment. But I think for me, I would have been an uproar of David Marshall not being selected given how much he had contributed to getting us there. And mm. I think he deserved that opportunity to play at the Euros for that reason. But as you say, he's kind of slipped down the pecking order at Derby. And I think now's the right time to start having a look at the the goalkeepers for the future, essentially, which you know Liam Kelly's been 
outstanding at Motherwell since he's he's came back up the road from QPR. Liam's obviously been involved in a couple of squads before, so he's not he's not new to the international setup, but it's good for him to get recognition, obviously, ex Livingston player as well. So delighted to see Liam involved. And I think Xander Clark deserves it as well. And he adds a goal threat from our goalkeepers, which I don't think we've ever had. Um, so Xander Clark, again, second half of last season, unbelievable form that he showed. So again, thoroughly deserved to have been in the squad. But I think, as you mentioned, Craig Gordon will be the number one going forward. And again, he's had a very good start to the season with Hearts. So that I have no qualms with that. Totally agree with you. I think Jason Kerr is a bit unlucky again uh, to maybe miss out. But the likes of... You know, for example, Patterson maybe not being available, Donald maybe not being available could open the door for the likes of maybe a Sean Rooney, uh, for example, to get into the squad. But uh, again, I agree with you. I don't have many qualms over it. Uh, good to see Kenny McLean back involved. I'm a big fan of his. I think he's a very good player. He might get a bit more game time, obviously, with McGinn, possibly looking like he could miss one or two games. Could open the door for the likes of David Turnbull as well to get a start uh, over in Denmark. But Going on to the actual games themselves, I'm gutted because I was meant to be going to Denmark and Austria, so I'm no longer able to go to either. I did manage to get a ticket <laughs> for Denmark, but you know it got refunded because UEFA stopped the way fans travelling. Uh, so not able to go to both, so it'll be a pub and TV job for me. But what's your thoughts on the three games themselves? Um, I think it's a very, very tough week. We've seen Denmark and the Euros just there, you know, very good team, you know. Considering especially what they went through, you know, losing kind of Christian Eriksen to, you know, what was a very, very scary moment. Um, the character showed by them to, you know, kind of bounce back and, you know, kind of get back to the semi-finals, I believe. Um, and even then, it was a extremely dodgy penalty that put them out. Absolute jokers, those English. But, you know, but I, I Denmark, very good team, have been for a while. And I was going over there, it's going to be a very, very tough game. And in all honesty, if we get something from that, I will be a little bit surprised. Um, I don't really see us doing anything out there. And I think that's the kind of like, the issue with us playing Denmark and Austria both away in the same week, it's one of those weeks that you could, that you know, could end up kind of like ruining our chances. I know that we're in a decent spot right now, but two losses against two teams who are competing with, to, you know, kind of get out of this group stage. You can see a lot of fans kind of starting to, you know, have wee murmurs, you know. There's already people kind of complaining about Steve Clark and whatnot, which I think is pretty silly at this moment in time. But we've got our two toughest games of the group, essentially, in the same week. Um, so we've just got to kind of hope for the best, in all honesty. Um, two away games against two very decent teams, two teams who were at the Euros. But I think the Austria one's probably the one that we've got to be looking at is more likely to, you know, pick something up from. Moldova, I don't really like saying with Scotland that it should be a given that we should be winning a game, but... Never, never say it's a given with Scotland. We can exactly. always throw a spanner in the works. We're brilliant at it. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. We'll probably end up going and beating Denmark and Austria and then getting pumped 3 now off the Moldova, but the Moldova game has to be taken care of itself. We've got to, you know, we've got to take three points from that. If we're really serious about, you know, going to this World Cup, we have to take three points from this. And in all honesty, if we don't take points from either of the two away games as well, I think we could maybe be in a wee spot of baller. But, you know, we should be on, you know, a decent kind of form. We should be kind of looking at, you know, our performances the last kind of couple of years and that and be, you know, not too scared to go, uh, to go and play against these sides. You know, we have like a system got decent players and know we are missing a few but let's go out there and see what happens and um, we should be riding our coattails now that we've qualified for a tournament got that hoodoo off our back and yeah just see where it takes us it's uh, a very difficult triple header isn't it the Denmark game as you mentioned they were I was really impressed watching them a few of their games at the Euros really impressive side really well organised now one of these international sides that you know maybe Christian Eriksen aside they don't have many kind of superstars and their team as such, they're just a very good team. And, you know, they they play with two wing-backs who were both very, very threatening going forward. Uh, you'll probably, your knowledge of European football is a bit better than mine, but it was the boy on the left-hand side in particular that impressed me, right-footed, left wing-back, scored a couple of good goals as well during the tournament at the Euros. So he was very impressive. So they, they have threats over the park, Denmark. But if you look at the triple header as a whole, I think six points is a must. And if you're going to take your six points from any of the two games, in all honesty, I would almost sacrifice the Denmark game because I think they will run away with the group eventually. And I think we will be looking at second spot 
and it could come down to that head to head with with Austria in the end. And I think you know we played Austria back in March, the the opening game of the qualifiers, and I, I didn't think a great deal of Austria to be honest. I think they got really lucky getting away from hand and with a point. And I watched a couple of their games at the Euros, and they seemed like a really hit or miss team. You know, I watched them against Holland, albeit Holland are a good side, but they were really passive and very negative. Um, they weren't, I, I know they beat Macedonia and then polar opposite against Italy. I thought they were excellent against Italy in the last 16 time, took them to extra time and almost took them the, the whole distance. And, you know, so they're a bit unpredictable, to be honest, but they have some very good players in there as well. You know, Alaba has been playing in the back three for them quite a lot. Um, middle of a back three on a lot of occasions, very versatile player. I think, um, as I say, out of, out of the games, you mentioned Moldova, it's got to take care of itself. We've got to, you know, you can't afford to drop points in those type of games or else you don't deserve to qualify for, for tournaments if you're doing that. But I think the Austria one's the biggie for me. We definitely, in my opinion, need to go and take three points from that because we still have in this group the banana skin, which is Israel at uh, Hamden. We, we know what Israel can do to us. So I think that also helps with that if we if we take care of Austria. But three very, very tough games. And and as you mentioned, you know, there's been Steve Clark signed a new deal, which I'm I'm delighted about. I think the the national team has progressed significantly since Steve Clark came in, albeit he had a very tough start. He had two games against Belgium and two games against Russia, I think, in his first five, um, which isn't a, which isn't an ideal start. But I think after that, he got a bit of momentum going, which obviously culminated in his qualifying. And I think, again, he got a lot of criticism for the Euros performances, but I actually think we acquitted ourselves quite well in a few of the games. So the, his contract extension seemed to come with a lot of negativity, which I find baffling, considering he's taken us to a major tournament for the first time in 23 years. But there you go. That is Scottish football in a nutshell for you. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it, though. I think there are three exciting games. And... The Moldova game in particular, on paper, doesn't seem exciting, but the fact that you're going to get a big crowd back in Hamden, I think will make a big difference for that one. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting week. Um, yeah, hopefully we can, you know, put some good performances together and, you know, get the points on the board because, yeah, it'd be absolutely great to, you know, go one step further from qualifying from the Euros and qualify for the World Cup as well, but... Yeah, it's not going to be easy for us. We're going to have to apply ourselves. Um, not ideal to be missing a whole bunch of players, but you know it could be a moment for you know players to step up. I mean, you look over to like the last like, year or so. I mean, you've seen Lyndon Dykes come in, take his opportunity. Now he's one of the main players in the squad. Billy Gilmore, breakout player from the tournament as well. You know, maybe there's one of them kind of waiting in the ranks. Maybe if uh, Patterson comes out of isolation in time, could get the nod at right wing back, and you know could end up doing something. Um, but yeah, hopefully we can all just. Just get behind the team, and I want to say it really annoyed me kind of later on in the Euros where people were just greeting about, you know, oh, the player who was linked with their team wasn't he playing or whatnot. It was like, just just get behind the team, actually just support them and, you know, see where it goes. Like, but, you know, you're never ever going to get that with Scotland fans, are you? So, but fingers crossed, hopefully we'll come out of this with, you know, a good couple of points and, yeah, we can get on our way to Qatar. What a fun place that'll be to go, right? It's, it would be so yeah, typical Scotland that we qualify for the Euros where barely any fans get to go, uh, despite the fact it's on home tough. You don't even get the luck. The, the furthest we got to travel was London. And, <laughs> you know, nowhere really exotic. And then we'll go and qualify for Qatar. I mean, the Tartan army will fry and it's in December. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's going to be... It's going to be an absolute nightmare, but will I try and go to Qatar? Of course I bloody would. Uh, if it means getting to see us at a World Cup. But as you say, Angus... Uh, need to have some positive results over this triple header in order to do that. Is there any players that you're in particular looking to see get a chance in the three games? Barring the usual answer of uh, the the best informed striker in the world, Lyndon Dykes, um, I just have to say I'm excited to see Billy Gilmore again. Um, obviously, that performance against England was incredible, and we were robbed of you know seeing that again in the Croatia game. What a massive miss he was. Um, so yeah, it'll be good to see you know him playing again in a Scotland jersey. I think for me, he has to play uh, straight away against Denmark if we're going to have any chance of you know keeping the ball against like a team like that. He's very imperative to that. Other than that, though, I'm not too sure. In all honesty, the kind of 
the the absences that we have, it kind of throws up an awful lot of uncertainty as to like where he's kind of going to go, uh, going to go with this uh, uh, kind of like starting eleven. Uh, you mentioned David Turnbull earlier. Based on his performance today against Rangers, I'm a wee bit less kind of excited about that. Uh, I don't think he had a great game at all. I think he went a wee bit hiding. Um, maybe the pressure on a game, you know, away from home as well, wouldn't be the ideal kind of uh, situation for him. Um, but aye, who knows? Um, but yeah. I'm really struggling to think of anybody off the top of my head in all honesty that I would kind of properly change um, is that maybe a negative I don't know but got to see what happens and see what team uh, Steve Clark picks out is there anything that comes to you straight away? One thing's for certain I really want to see the combination of uh, Gilmore and McGregor again um, which we had down at Wembley I thought you know don't get me wrong Billy Gilmore's debut was uh, well his, his first start was exceptional for a young player coming into that environment and putting his authority on the game the way he did. But I think Callum McGregor really went under the radar in that game and he had probably his best performance in a Scotland jersey. And he obviously gave us that moment, probably my moment of the tournament, which was seeing us score at a major tournament for the first time in 20-odd years. So uh, I'd like to see that combination resurrected. I think both players are really good ball retention players. And as you say, with two away games, I think that's imperative that we try and retain the ball as much as you can. But there might be the option to put Kenny McLean in there with Gilmore. They're playing together at Norwich as well. So that might be an idea for Clark to explore. I'm also looking forward to seeing more of Dykes and Adams paired together. I think you could see there was a partnership developing uh, in the Euros games. A few combinations here or there. I'd like to see a bit more from the two of them together. The Moldova game in particular is a great opportunity for that. We know Clark quite often will maybe play a almost a false centre forward up with Dykes. The likes of Christie and Ryan Fraser have played that role before very effectively as well. So you don't know if he might do that. The other one you mentioned was was Turnbull. Uh, at the end of the day, you know McGinn typically plays off the front, doesn't he? And behind the two, the two, uh, the two up top. And that's probably the ideal role for someone like Turnbull as well, who you know gets goals from the middle of the park. So it might give him that chance, that Denmark game, to get in. But I'm, as I say, really looking forward to the three games. And let's just hope we get we get the points needed to help us get to Qatar in 2022. Following the international break, Livy are back in action as we travel to Dundee to face James McPake's side. Ewan, we really need to get some points on the board from this one, don't we? I think, uh, I know it's only five games into the season, but I think you'll see a lot of Livy fans talking about it as being a must win, even at this early stage. You know, I was I was chatting with one of my pals, he, he messaged me about how we performed at Easter Road and I was like, I think we just need a result to turn the corner and get off this kind of run of results, this rut that we seem to be in. I think one win could spark a a little run. I'm not saying the exact same as last season. I'm not saying that, but maybe just three or four positive results in the spin and it puts a totally different perspective on our start to the season. I think that's how little it'll take. And, you know, it's it's going to be a very tough game. Uh, We've got kind of a mixed record at Dens Park. Sometimes, you know, that's going over the years, kind of playing in the championship as well as in the top flight. But, you know, Dundee have had a... Uh, Apache start to the season would be the best way to describe it. Decent result in the opening day against St Mirren. Uh, came back to get a point. And then they got an absolute hiding at Celtic Park, uh, which you know any team is capable of uh, being on the end of, to be honest. Uh, and they got a draw last week as well and got beat at Far Park just there. So, you know, everyone's talking about our start to the season, but Dundee have only got two points on the board. They've not won a game in the league yet. So it's not like there's teams running away from us already. But, you know, there's the obvious steps from Dundee. Jason Cummins has scored a couple of goals already this season. He's scored goals against us before, back in his Hibs days. So he'll be a threat. Charlie Adam as well. Everyone knows Charlie Adam. You know, I think it's it's imperative that we we don't allow him to dictate the game and get a foothold in the game. And there'll be the return of a familiar face, which is Sean Byrne as well. <laughs> uh, coming back to the club, he's, you know, he fell out of favour at Livy, uh, second half of our first season back up. And he's gone to Dundee and he's, you know, reading Dundee fans' comments, he's been very crucial to their kind of run at the tail end of last season, which resulted in them going up through the playoffs. So, you know, it'll be, it'll be nice to see Sean back at, 
back at Livy, albeit in the wrong coloured jersey. But um, but I think it's going to be a tough game. But I'm I'm not scared of playing Dundee. You know, I think at the back, I don't think they're they're all that. You know, Ashcroft and Fontaine, I think you can get at them. And I think we're capable of scoring against them. But as I say, we're going to need to be really, really switched on because they do have players that can punish you. And we need to be need to be on our guard for that. Very tough game, but I, I am I am confident we can go there and, and get a positive result. I'm very confident in that because I've seen enough of us going forward that we can hurt teams. And I think, you know, as I say, Dundee aren't all that at the back. They've got frailties, and I think we can get at them. I think the two teams kind of mirror each other in that way that, you know, we're both probably going to be looking at each other's back lines and thinking, you yeah, know, we can get at them. Um, they'll certainly be thinking that by looking at our performances at the back. And then obviously the likes of Jason Cummins and that can, you know, punish like even the best of teams at times. Um, I'm really looking forward to the prospect of Alan Forrest coming up against Christy Elliott on, you know, Forrest playing on our left-hand side and Elliott on that right. I know Elliott was playing against Celtic and he was had an absolute shocker of a game. Like I think it was Ryan Christie he was up against on that left hand side and he was getting turned about and ran for like, like ragged. Um obviously Alan Forrest maybe like won't be able to fully encapsulate like a full Celtic performance. I know just by himself he's he'll maybe get close to that. But um yeah, I think that's a very exciting kind of thing that we can look forward to, you know, him causing an awful lot of problems to that's, yeah, that, you know what I find it really insulting Angus that you've had to talk about Alan Forrest and you've had to mention Celtic in, in a similar sentence you know let Alan forget that he's brother of James for just I'm a moment just, I've just said that Alan could probably but single handedly you know kind of recreate a, a 6-0 humping um, and he's going to prove that right uh, two weeks from now um, and then I'll be laughing at all of you to be fair um, but I <laughs> get back to the kind of thoughts on the game. Yeah, I think it's going to be a very competitive battle, to be honest. I think, you know, you look at both sides and, yeah, I could easily see this being quite an exciting game, in all honesty. I think the, both teams' back lines create that kind of unexpectancy of what will actually happen. Um, but both in midfield and that, I think it'll be interesting, you know, Burn uh, and Adam, you know, coming against the likes of Pittman and, uh, like, Jason Holt or that. I think it's very... Quite an interesting one to think of. I don't see an awful lot of like a gap in quality between the two sides. And yeah, um, obviously we'll hopefully be there and um, be able to cheer the team on and then get our first points on the board. But nothing to fear. But I think that they'll also be thinking the same. So it's a very cracking tie that we have on our hands. We say it almost every week, but you know, Dundee will be looking at us the exact same way as we're looking at them. They'll be looking at it as a massive opportunity to get their first win on the board and open our gap up at this early stage of the season with ourselves at the bottom of the league. So they'll be looking to get their first win as well. As you say, there's there's not a great deal probably to choose between the two teams on paper, but um, I'm really, I don't know why I've got, a, I'm really confident that we can open them up and score a couple of goals up there. <laughs> as I say, just my biggest concern is, you know, you've got the likes of Charlie Adams delivery into the box. We've seen how we are with defending dead balls, cross balls, Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it, it gives me a bit of a worry and I agree with you I think there's goals in this you know Dundee's two home games so far this season have both been two each draws with St Mirren and Hibs so there's been goals in their games at Dens Park and I think that says a lot about Dundee it shows that they have frailties at the back but they are capable of punishing teams as well so I think it could be quite a, an exciting game and as I say, hopefully we can get up there to to watch it as well. Uh, hopefully you are not pinged. Hopefully I'm not pinged in the next few weeks as well. So <laughs> uh, fingers crossed for all that. But going on, uh, going on to predictions. Then, what's your thoughts for the game? Do you think we're going to get off the mark for the season? I'm going to be positive. I'm going to say aye, and I'm not only just going to say a point. I'm going to go for all three, and I'm going bloody to bloody hell, Mister Negativity has gone for three points. The first time since probably January, I'm predicting this. <laughs> <laughs> but screw it, we're going to we're going to get everything out of our system during this international break. I'm going to go for three two to Livingston. Um, I'm going to also say that put money on Charlie Adam to get an assist for a set piece. Um, but Alan Forrest is going to do it. He's going to do it. I've, I've bigged him up now. I've got to fully support him. He's getting he's getting at least one goal. Bye three two Livingston. Hopefully I'm right. Hopefully I don't get egg in my face. 
you know, I know it's actually quite funny you talk about your predictions. As soon as we lost our first game against St Johnston after our unbeaten run, it's amazing how quickly your attitude changed towards predictions. Uh, <laughs> it just nah, don't fancy us this week. Yeah. But um, you know, Angus, I've not really been wrong. To be fair, yeah, to be fair, you have a point. you have a point. Uh, I'm going to be positive as well, and I'm I'm going to copy you. Um, I think that I think this is going to be a blockbuster game and a blockbuster way for us to get our first three points this season. I think we're going to win three two, and I again I totally agree with you. Get some money on a Charlie Adam assist from a dead ball. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we both both predicted, uh, three two victories. Um, I hope you're all looking forward to that nil nil draw. <laughs> Epic nil nil with not a single shot on target. <laughs> Well, tell you what, at least it would be a point and we're off the mark for the season, wouldn't it, at the end of the day? But here's hoping uh, it's as exciting as me and Angus think it'll be. Uh, I can tell this is going to come and bite us in the arse, but here's hoping we can go up to Dens Park and get three points on the board. Aye, we we oh, have totally be... lined this up for the yeah, most drabest nil-nil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. However, if one fan listens to us, if we encourage... At least one Livy fan who wasn't planning to go to go because they've listened to us go. I they're right. This could be quite an exciting game. <laughs> if we if we win somebody money from Charlie yeah, Adam assists, <laughs> then oh, I can I, 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 well it'll be fucking no no. That's it for this week's episode of Talk Livy. Thanks again to every single one of you for tuning in week in, week out. If you can, we'd love to hear your feedback. Either leave us a review on iTunes or simply message us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. As Ewan said, we're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Search Talk Livy to find us. You'll find all the links to our weekly episodes on there as well. You can also find all our episodes, including this one, on all good podcast streaming sites, including iTunes and Spotify. We're also on YouTube, so don't forget to subscribe to the channel. If none of those options suit you, though, all you have to do is head to our website, talkliffypodcast.libson.com, where you'll find every single episode we have done over the last few years. That's it for this week's episode. Thanks again for tuning in. Let's hope for another great week following the Lothian's finest football team and also for some positive results for the national team in the World Cup qualifiers. Livingston, oh Livingston, into the premier